uh, series. I hope uh, I hope that you've been coming, and I hope you will come to the future year of lectures. Um, we don't have a lecture next Thursday, um, and I believe the one on October 6th is also going to have to be um, rescheduled. So uh, it may be it may be not until October 13th that we have another. Um, let me look at the schedule and be sure. That's right. This, 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 so the next lecture in the series will be October 13th. But there are two other activities in, uh, between now and then. One you definitely don't want to miss, and that's tonight at 8 o'clock <laughs> in the Bailey Performance Hall. There will be um, about 10 uh, musicians and dancers performing a wide range of traditional uh, music and dance from from uh, Peru, and uh, it's going to be a great show. So that's at the Bailey Hall tonight at eight o'clock. Uh, that's a ticketed event. They're ten dollars, I, I think. They might be they might be a little bit more, but they're just kind of seven for students. There we go. Um, so it's a great opportunity. You won't see anything else like this uh, um, unless you go to Peru. I think. Um, and then we'll also have on October um, 5th, the Year of Peru Day, um, <clears throat> which uh, that's a Wednesday at 12.30 in the Student Center, and that will feature, also feature a lot of different types of performances, uh, mostly uh, local performers, um, and also um, who are from Peru originally, and then also Peruvian food. Um, so. Put those things on your calendar. I hope, hope you'll be able to uh, join us. Um, today's uh, speaker is uh, Jessica Stevenson, who is a faculty member here at KSU. She's um, an assistant professor in visual arts, and also she's a uh, curator of the African Art um, um, Exhibition at the Michael uh, Carlos Museum in Atlanta. Um, she has also served as associate curator of ancient American art. Um, she participates quite often in our year of program because she really knows uh, quite a bit about a number of different art traditions around the world. Uh, she studied at the University of Witwatersrand in South Africa um, and at Emory University, uh, where she completed an MA in on Inca architecture. Uh, with a PhD of contemporary African art. Um, she's currently organizing an exhibit in collaboration with the University of Pennsylvania Museum of Art, um, which uh, details the 1904 uh, collecting expedition of a uh, German explorer to the Belgian Congo, uh, Leo Fabini. Uh, so we're really delighted that Jessica is sharing her expertise um, with us uh, again, and um, well, thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Dan. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, very, very happy to be here and to be sharing this material with you, which I really love. Um, I have a lot to get through, um, and I'm going to be reading a fairly long piece. I'm probably going to have to pause periodically and paraphrase some of the material. And at the outset, I just want to um, sort of set the stage for you know what what the conceptual framework is for this piece. Um, this is not an archaeologically or necessarily a historically grounded um, piece. Um, my goal here is really to um, present a very conceptual piece. It's really rooted in um, philosophy, trying to understand some key Inca philosophical concepts, and it's also very grounded in visual analysis. And I've actually had to cut out a lot of the visual analysis just to try to keep within um, the one, one hour time frame that is my goal. Um, so just to set the stage, um, uh, you know, the Inca are certainly, uh, you know, well known for their incredible architectural monuments. Um, undoubtedly, everyone is very familiar with um, Machu Picchu, which is a, a UNESCO World Heritage Site, this incredible architectural site that's kind of folded like a cloak over the top of a mountain. Um, here, here is an example. I mean, here's a 
uh, a building from Machu Picchu um, known as the Observatory. Um, so they're well known for you know incredible architectural feats, the ability to build um, uh, cities and and beautiful fine buildings um, nestled within the Andean mountains. Um, they're also really well known for their extraordinary stonework. Um, developed quite a, a diverse iconography, what I'm going to call an iconography of stonework. Um, here we have just three examples of different styles of stonework um, that, that have survived to the present day in um, Cuzco, which was the, the, the capital of the Inca Empire. So at the bottom right, we have this really fine, very regular stonework. At the top, we see it becomes a little more organic and patchworky, and then it extends even further to these wonderful kind of pillowing um, stonework techniques. Um, today, I'm going to focus on, oh, and then of course, um, you know, just really sort of um, integrated their architecture into the natural landscape, created these incredible terraces. Here we have two nestled in the Urubamba Valley. And many of these terraced works really were, they were earthworks, they were sculptures, and they weren't always intended to hold um, uh, plants that would be consumed. Many of them were filled with fields of flowers, right? But today, I'm going to be focusing on just one aspect, one small aspect of Inca architecture that I think is really the most important aspect of Inca architecture, namely um, thresholds, doorways, niches, um, which take this very distinctive trapezoidal shape, so they are narrower at the top than they are at the bottom. Um, many of them have multiple uh, jams. So here we have these very elaborate niches that kind of telescope inwards. I'm also going to be looking, I'm extending the idea of the threshold to also include caves. Many of these cave sites also contain within them other thresholds, man-made thresholds, namely these doorways and niches. So um, today I'm going to be really talking about the concept of the threshold and um, the history of this particular shape, the trapezoid and its conceptual meaning for the Inca. Okay, so I'm going to start off with a fairly long introduction. I hope I don't um, lose you along the way. That just kind of sets the stage for thinking about the idea of the threshold, but also thinking about movement and stasis. For the Inca, movement, traveling, moving, physically moving through the landscape, and then points where you stopped to perform things was extremely important. So I want to kind of map that out to begin with. The empire of Tehuantinsuyu, which can be translated as the four parts together, arose in the 15th century when a small Inca kingdom in the south central Andes attained hegemony over its neighbors. Under the leadership of a dynasty of rulers known as the Sapa Inca, the kingdom expanded along paths of military conquest in the Urubamba Valley and beyond. Within a century, the Inca kingdom had come to dominate the social and economic life of a vast empire divided into four provinces, or Suyus, each province named after the most powerful ethnic group living within it. To the northwest of the, the capital city, Cusco, lay the region of Chincha Suyu, which you see at the top, which encompassed the dry desert of the north coast and the Sierra of Peru and the southern portion of what is today Ecuador. Northeast of Cuzco, the province known as Antisuyu contained the fertile, mountainous eastern slopes of the south-central Andes. The southeastern section of the, uh, of the empire, Calasuyu, included the grassy altiplano of the late Titicaca region as well as northern Chile, Argentina, and Bolivia. The fourth province, Kuntisuyu, took in the area south and southwest of Cuzco in the south-central barren coastline of Peru. To sustain and extend its military and political ventures in this vast and ethnically diverse region, the Inca state devised systematic approaches to empire building. A key uh, element of this governance and unification plan was supplied by the road system, which you also see mapped out here, which allowed the Inca elite, soldiers, artisans, and administrators to export their culture from Cusco to their regional, religious, and administrative settlements. 
Raw and finished products, the components of the tribute system, namely yamas, maize, cloth, and pottery, were transported along the highways among the various environmental zones of the Andes. These goods were intended to sustain administrators and soldiers while supporting Inca cults and the estates of the royal families. The roads were also traversed by large portions of the population in order to fill their mita service, which was a labor tax imposed on the subject people for the construction of roads, imperial estates, storage facilities, and religious centers. Moreover, to prevent local rebellions, the Inca moved subjugated peoples into new territories under the Mi'kmaq, or colonialist system. Using the highways was therefore a mechanism of power. John Heisler points out that road construction was employed to introduce Inca rule into conquered territories. Throughout the empire, a subject's Mita service would entail traveling on or building and maintaining aspects of the road system, usually that portion that traversed his community's territory. Hence, the roads not only tied subjects to the state, the Inca highway were also constant reminders of who was in charge of infrastructure and governance. Roads, however, were not open to the general populace. Most of the peasantry had no occasion to use the highways unless at the bidding of the state, such as when they were required to pay annual taxes at city centers or during forced removals in which people were re relocated from one conquered region to another. The only persons free to travel beyond their own local territories were court officials um, or those possessing special passes. Roadblocks to monitor travelers were set up outside main sites. The checkpoints were maintained at bridges, way stations called tambos, lookout platforms, and sun temples. In addition, defensive fortifications, including those at Alonte Tambo, Kizak, and Pizak were built at mountain passes connecting the valleys along the coast in the highlands. Directing and restricting mobility was a highly effective mechanism of control. For Andean peoples are nomadic by necessity, required to migrate seasonally between diverse ecological zones for agricultural and herding purposes. The importance of movement and its regulation through prescribed patterns is evident in ritual architectural contexts. In some sites like Machu Picchu, cascades of stairs and tortuous paths challenge one's sense of order and orientation. These architectural elements are spun out in highly energized arrangements so that someone moving through them has a heightened awareness of his or her progression and a proportional relationships both to other travelers and to the surrounding environment. At Machu Picchu, the spatial configurations are complex, while at other sites, such as Huanaku Tanku that you see here, they are ordered and hierarchical, but no less dominating in the manipulation of a person's passage through them. The Inca's preoccupation with movement as a means for organizing the spatial, temporal, and social realms is embodied in the seque system. Radiate, radiating out from the Curicancha, which was the principal sun temple in the capital city of Cusco, were 41 lines or seques. And we see here a diagram of these lines that do not exist as actual paths in the landscape. They're more like conceptual lines that connected um, shrines. Um, and you would walk, you would start walking from the center of Cuzco, from the Sun Temple, and would walk out to a number of shrines along the way. So the Seque systems basically um, entail movement and in points of stasis where you would um, perform rituals at shrines. So radiating out from the Kari Kancha, the principal Sun Temple in Cuzco, were 41 lines or Seques. Located on them were some 328 pockets which can be interpreted as a sacred place. Usually these were features in the landscape, such as rocks, springs, and canals. The lines were grouped according to the four districts, or suyus, of Cusco that in turn corresponded with the four provinces of the empire. Each of the lines was associated with an individual panaka, or royal corporation, as well as an aklu, or kin group. The quarkas along the seques, particularly water canals, mark the boundaries between each of these kin groups' estates. Throughout the ritual calendar, members of the Panaka or the Aklu 
would travel along these lines to their respective quarkers in order to perform various rituals. The Seke system oriented the social hierarchy of land ownership in the Cusco region, and quarkers on the Seke system functioned as regulatory and static points in the topography and in the mobility of the various social groups. In ritual architectural contexts, as on roads and along the seques, movement was ordered and contained at doorways or thresholds. For example, in this passageway near Chinchero, which is near um, Cusco, it provides an illustration of how movement could be guided and therefore governed at a threshold. This entrance to a natural rocked cleft is subtly smoothed and geometricized on either side, and a flight of stairs has been carved into the rock, creating a means by which to pass through the cleft. However, down the middle of the stairway, a fissure or channel exists in the original rock formation, which has been left unaltered. Over here. This fissure impedes the climb up the stairs, forcing one to proceed awkwardly, perhaps from side to side in a zigzag motion. The cleft threshold operates as a boundary, imposing stasis and containment of one space from another, and as a point of control and potential transformation. And it's very likely that this cleft was used in the initiation of young uh, children into adulthood, that water would have actually flowed down the central channel, and the movement, the spatial movement of the zigzag was also extremely important because it connected to lightning, which in turn collected, connected one to the weather gods. Um, the idea of the liminal threshold in both a physical and a conceptual sense, mediating between the sacred and the secular, is a well-developed Inca principle exemplified in the huaca, which is this term for a sacred, a sacred thing. Huaca is a Quechua word which could mean, can be translated as split, double, other or apart. All sacred places, beings or persons were known as huacas. Certain mountains, rocks, springs, and other natural features were also considered to be huacas, as were the mummified bodies of Inca ancestors. The fact that one definition of the word huaca is split or double reinforces the idea of a sacred place or being that can mediate between the spiritual between the supernatural and the human, or comprise within itself what is both mortal and divine, or material and immaterial. It even suggests why the Inca lavished such attention on clefts in particular. This is most overtly expressed at Machu Picchu, where a pathway leads to a nat natural rock cleft that has been marked in a way that reveals the sophistication of Inca aesthetics and conceptual, conceptual sensibilities. Here, at an opening to a subterranean chamber that served as a shrine and a burial place, balance between um, nature and culture, the organic and the structured, is conveyed through the convergence of natural and man-made walls forming the entrance cleft. So you can see here, this is, um, this is all natural stonework, but then you have these wonderful, and here we have natural unworked stonework, but then we have man-made stone that almost appears as though it's poured into the space. So this great balance between the two. <laughs> While control, control has been manifested through elements as diverse as the vast road system, carved outcrops, and water canals, um, today I will consider architectural thresholds, particularly doorways, windows, and niches as powerful media for structuring and governing movement in social, natural, and spiritual landscapes. Anthropologist Victor Turner has explained the threshold, which he calls the Lyman, as a point of transition from one space or state to another. Doorways and windows are clearly liminal. They define boundaries and intervene between spaces, from the private area inside a dwelling to the public areas outside, for example. As an intermediary state or space, 
The threshold forms uh, marks a place of potential transformation and dangerous ambiguity, requiring that, that it be hedged around by ritual interdictions and taboos. For the Inca, who regarded the human body as alpa kamaska, which can be translated as animated earth, passing through an architectural stone threshold may have been construed as a fleeting moment during which they metaphorically return to stone, thus achieving a momentary oneness with stone and therefore with the past. And I'll explore these, these ideas um, later. This notion is incorporated into the Inca myth of the journey made by four ancestral brothers to establish the Inca Empire. After emerging from a cave, which is itself a threshold, at a place called Pakari Tambo, they decided, to, they, they decided to conquer the surrounding land and subsequently establish the Cusco Empire. However, when one of the brothers resisted, he was walled up inside the cave. The other siblings then traveled northwards, reached the mountains of Huanacari, where yet another brother was transformed into a stone. Upon reaching the Urubamba Valley, um, yet another brother became a sacred rock at the intersection of two rivers. The three lithified brothers were therefore thereafter worshipped as important sacred beings for quakas. Their bodies had returned to rock, to stone, to earth, the original holy and unchanging substance from which all Inca humankind had been fashioned. The remaining siblings founded Cusco in the Inca Empire. In this myth, the journey was punctuated by static intervals when sacred places were formed through lithification. So there's this interesting dynamic between the idea of the human body being flesh and then times when it's actually transformed into stone, which is earth and connects people back to the past and to the first time of creation, which was defined as being an earthly realm, a time of... Um, of ambiguity and darkness, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little later as well. The visual vocabulary of Inca doorways and windows, notably the trapezoidal shape and the double or triple jams, is also utilized in niches. <laughs> Um, suggesting that they too be read as conceptual thresholds. Indeed, in caves, the places from which humankind was believed to have originated, niches may have functioned as conduits through which the ancestors entered the world. And we see in many caves, such as this one, which is near Machu Picchu, that we have very elaborate um, work architecture that has, has been incorporated that really look like kind of f false facades to buildings with kind of false doors and niches, suggesting the idea that these are dwellings from which ancestors emerge. They come through the cave to the outside world. <laughs> Um, the idea of the association between niches and um, ancestors is clearly illustrated at the ceremonial precinct of Makalakta, which is probably the mythical Pakari Tambo, which is the original cave from which the Inca emerged, um, and from where they then came to found Cusco. Uh, and here we have a plan of Makalakta, and I want you to look at the bottom section, the most sort of elaborate section. Here, a central plaza is lined with nine triple jammed niches. The central niche on the north wall is pierced to form a small entrance into a maze-like chamber studded with further niches. Brian Bauer speculates that the unusual niche entrance between the central court and the inner chamber may have represented a window or a cave through which an image of the first ancestor, Manco Kapak, might have emerged on certain ceremonial occasions. And there is a lot of evidence, um, actually sort of the, 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 the next chapter to my piece is really a wonderful book um, by an art historian, Susan Niles, called The Shape of Inca History, in which she uh, maps out how these particular sites were revisited annually by different Sapa Inca who kind of recreated many of these foundation myths uh, on a yearly basis and also tied their own personal biographies and exploits to them. So these niches often held images. 
In Inca temples, according to the, uh, the account of chroniclers, harp crackers were often kept in niches, such as those of the prin principal Inca temple at Cusco, the Coricancho that we see here. Cesar de Leon, traveling to Cusco in the 1540s, describes niches against a wall which the rising self sun fell upon, and the stones were very skillfully perforated and the openings set with precious stones and emeralds. These niches were for the Lord Incas. The Lord Incas could refer to the living Sapa Inca of the day or the mummified bodies of past rulers themselves important quarkers. A niche provided a liminal space, being itself a quarker, in which to place another walker and therefore negotiate between and protect the realms of the sacred and the secular. So today, um, through an analysis of archaeological remains, published photographs, and especially um, chroniclers' texts, I'm mostly drawing on the work of three early chroniclers, as well as contemporary anthropological material collected um, by Claassen. I'm going to view Inca thresholds within a number of contexts and themes that I see as seminal to Inca cultural principles. First of all, I'm going to look at how architectural elements from earlier kingdoms, from earlier great empires, were appropriated and reincorporated into the construction of Inca thresholds um, to express Inca mythic claims of origin, authenticity, and hegemonic rule. The trapezoidal shape of the Inca threshold is then discussed as an imprimatur of authority, a symbol of the territorial and cosmic hub of the empire. And then lastly, I will look at the role played by thresholds in connecting the center and periphery, uh, sorry, the role played by thresholds in connecting the center and the periphery is also considered. And then lastly, I will consider the way in which thresholds, windows in particular, frame panoramic views. They become metaphoric instruments of capture, con conquest, and transformation. Okay, the threshold of Inca origins and identity. Originally, an insignificant people living on the outskirts of the, of the Cusco Valley, the Inca developed a grand mythic history to monumentalize and sacralize their ascendancy to rule over the Andean region in the 15th and 16th centuries. Under the direction of nine Sapa Inca, Pachacuti, so we're focusing on Pachacuti, who is, this is a king list, but it's still very much up to debate as to how many of these kings prior to him really were historical personages or mythological ones. There's, this, there's, there's a possibility that some, some of them were actually co-regents. So we're focusing on what happens during Pachacuti's era forward. So under the direction of the ninth Sapa Inca, Pachacuti, architects cast this grand mythology into stone. They combined key architectural elements from sites of legendary import to accentuate the spatial and temporal path along which the Inca ancestors had journeyed to assume their position of hegemony and power. So before looking at these architectural sources, I'm going to briefly outline this myth. And this is a very simplified, truncated version of there really are two foundation myths. And some, sometimes they're actually kind of fused, um, which seems to be a later development. And so I'm presenting a, the, the, the kind of the fusion version of the two. So Inca chroniclers recount that the gods, most importantly, um, Inti, the sun god, and his descendants, who were the Inca, so the Inca, the Sapa Inca, consider themselves to be the living descendants of the sun god and therefore divine beings, um, originated at the city of Tiwanaku. Tiwanaku is way down south in northern Bolivia. It is a city that was the center of um, a major empire that flourished about from, from about 200 CE to about 1000 CE. So by the time the Inca came into being, Tiwanaku had long been abandoned, and in fact, their experience of it would have been as a ruined city. Um, so, they, so, so the city of Tiwanaku is located near Lake Titicaca. The first eight Inca, these mythical brothers and sisters led by Manku Kapak, um, traveled are said to have been born at Tiwanaku and then traveled underground when they then exited from a cave at Pakaritambo. 
And here's a, uh, an image of um, Inca, uh, subsequent Sapa Inca uh, presenting offerings outside this cave of Makari uh, Tambo that has been connected with um, a site called Makalata, which is about 28 miles south of present day um, Cusco. Eventually, they claimed to have reached the Urubamba Valley, subjugated its residents, built Cusco, going on to expand their empire in all directions. So this is the myth. Um, archaeological fact shows that Cusco was there before the Inca. The Inca did not build it. It was there for a long time. And uh, that probably they weren't, in fact, newcomers to the area. They were just local folks who gradually managed to uh, gain ascendancy over the area. So this grand uh, mythic history is articulated in the visual vocabulary of Inca architecture built by Pachacuti and subsequently, most notably in um, thresholds, in these trapezoidal thresholds, um, that were inspired by, Taiwan, uh, by Tiwanaku conventions of fine stone working and the embellishment of thresholds with double and triple jams and the step sign motif. One of the things that Pachacuti did was he actually imported stone workers from the Tiwanaku area to build at Cusco. So that also shows that there's a direct um, link between Tiwanaku and Cusco and um, the stonework itself. But I'm focusing specifically on the treatment of doorways at Tiwanaku and how the Inca kind of appropriated and reworked those. Um, these features appear on um, the so-called Gateway of the Sun. This is a monumental gateway. Um, at Tiwanaku, and this is the front of it. You can see at the top there is a very elaborate frieze. Uh, at the center is a frontal figure holding two staffs with a very elaborate raid headdress. This has often been interpreted as a representation of the sun god, Inti. On either side of him are profile figures that are either kneeling in supplication to the central figure or running towards the central figure or directing the viewer, you know, through the doorway itself. And those figures are a mix between human and bird and jaguar in the tree. The interesting thing is that the Inca did not draw their source of inspiration from the front of the Gateway of the Sun. Rather, they actually drew their inspiration from what we find at the back of it. So we have an interesting inversion there. And one of the things that the Inca did was they really eschewed um, figurative iconography. They established a style, an Inca style, that was abstract because they were ruling such a vast empire that was so di ethnically diverse that an abstract, very kind of Spartan mode of visual language um, would easily, could be easily overlaid and accommodate the ethnic differences and religious differences within their people. So I think it was a very purposeful um, choice to not draw from this iconography on the front, but rather to look at this abstract visual language at the back of it. And I think the fact that it's the back and the reverse side of it is also very significant in terms of the idea of thresholds and the past, drawing Tiwanaku as the past, the moment of creation into the present in Inca architecture. So the central doorway, the reverse, the back of the central doorway, is framed by a double jam and a step motif at the corners of the lintel, and it is bordered by two similarly embellished large shallow niches. In turn, four small niches are situated above the, above the larger unique niche. Uniting these elements is a triple-stepped design running the width of the gateway of the sun. The importance of these motifs to the Inca is underscored at, for example, a palace that was built on the island of the sun, as well as the ruins in a neighboring island of the moon on Lake Titicaca. There are two lakes today called the Island of the Sun and the Island of the Moon on Lake Titicaca, which are very important sites. That is where it is believed that um, the world was created, and the Inca built extensively on these locations. Uh, just to show you, this is another um, kind of example of Tiwanaku uh, stonework where we see these stepped in um, designs that the Inca were definitely referencing in their architecture. And here are the Incas the sort of reworkings and appropriations of aspects of Tiwanaku um, architecture on the island of the moon. 
These islands were sites of great religious significance because the Inca believed that they were the birthplace place of the creator god Viracocha and the point where the sun god Inti and the moon goddess rose from the lake. Uh, multiple doorways at these palace sites have double jams and step uh, motifs typical of Tiwanaku. So these Tiwanaku elements were um, employed in other Inca constructions at important locations throughout the empire. They basically exported um, Tiwanaku architecture and utilized it at key sites throughout the entire empire. Indeed, the fragmented and abstracted ruins of Tiwanaku, which was an abandoned site for some 500 years prior to the Inca arrival, um, which was said to be the stones carved by the creator god Viracocha, might potentially have been consciously echoed in, lands in Inca landscape carvings, such as this throne cut from a large rock outcrop in at Rodadero Drive. So here is Tiwanaku in its ruined state, and we start to see the Inca creating post Pachacuti a lot of things that look like this, sacred sites, and there's clearly a very strong visual resonance between the two. Um, this borrowed visual vocabulary embellished fountains. So here we have the double jammed and step motif, caves, and rock outcrops as well. Each of these places were conceptual thresholds called pacarina, or places of origin. They were huacas where the Inca and other Andean cultures believed gods or humans had emerged at the beginning of time. Um, you can see I'm going to run out of time, so I might have to start paraphrasing. Okay, so what is interesting about the treatment, and here are just two other examples of rock art crops that have been very subtly marked and articulated with, with elements from Tiwanaku, and clearly that you know they're articulated in a way that really speaks to the idea of a threshold or a doorway or a niche or a window from which something can emerge, in this case, an ancestor or a god. So something that I think is really significant about the treatment of many of these elements is that often um, the Inca reversed um, the, visual the, the visual language. At Tiwanaku, these, re these stepped niches and you know this would have been a niche extended back into the surface. Here it protrudes out. The step design at Tiwanaku actually recedes into the stonework. In the Inca treatment, they come forward towards us. So that again suggests a reversal, right? And that reversal is tied to the idea of if I can just find it, sorry folks. Okay, the reversal or inversion of the elements between Tiwanaku and um, the Inca sites is significant for two reasons. Firstly, the outward projection of the stone may better communicate the idea of emergence, that these are thresholds or pacarina from which gods and ancestral personages entered the world. Secondly, the transposing of Tiwanaku elements embodied the Inca's idea of pachacuti, which represented the idea of a cataclysmic end to an age and an inversion of time and space, which was nevertheless a rich time of potential and transformation. A Padakuri was an immediating period of sacred and highly dangerous fluidity when humans are believed to have come into the natural world. Um, this is analogously a liminal being, a conceptual threshold between eras. It is a time or place of reversals. The Pachacuti connected the past with the future. So these were um, sacred sites visually connecting back to the moment of time with Tiwanaku at which contemporary rituals were performed. And each time they were performed, those contemporary events or personages were connecting themselves back to the original point of creation. So the Inca thus appropriated and reconceptualized key aspects of the architecture of their place of mythic origin. In addition, they synthesized the, these elements with architectural aspects drawn from the more immediate temporal and geographical parkland. <laughs> 
So it has already been noted that the decorative treatment of Inca thresholds is in close spirit to that of the Gateway of the Sun at Tiwanaku. However, the shape of Inca thresholds and doorways is not. They are distinctly trapezoidal. Uh, an architectural shape that is not to be found at Tiwanaku, but is in fact a form that you see um, further north in the Highlands region. The properties of the trapezoid, so here we have Tawin Tiwanaku threshold, here we have um, Highlands trapezoid, and the Inca brought the two together. Okay. So the property of the trapezoid has obvious practical implications. The form decreases the weight to be borne by the stone lintel supporting the building. This is a valuable feature in a geographical region such as the Andes, which are plagued by earthquakes. As practical as it is, the trapezoid threshold is not an Inca invention, however. Although its origins remain obscure, it was used in the Andean highlands prior to the rise of the Inca state, during um, the Wari hegemony. The Wari were another really powerful, important um, empire that predated the Inca and um, were situated close to the Inca heartland. For example, at the pre-Inca Wari site, uh, at a pre-Inca Wari site, some 28 kilometers southwest of Cuzco, uh, trapezoidal niches have been discovered in Wari-style monumental walls dating to the late intermediate period. Quadrilaterally shaped doorways and niches are also evident at two types of, of dwellings that likewise predate the Inca. The Kulpi, which is a circular type of residential structure built in the northern reaches of the Andes, and the Cholpa, which is a circular tomb of the Lake Titicaca region. Um, so in addition to employing the general characteristics of the trapezoid, the Inca utilized more specific design elements such as the double jam and stepped sign motif that had antecedents in towns along the highway path from Tiwanaku to Cusco, like Chiripa and Kukara, the capital cities of two existing rival highland groups. So basically the threshold connects you back to Tiwanaku, but it also incorporates architectural styles predating the Inca that are tied to powerful empires that existed along the path that the mythic ancestors supposedly took in their journey from Tiwanaku to Cusco. So it's collapsing geography and time, uh, powerful geography and time, into one form. So Inca architects developed a new imperial style through the selective appropriation, synthesis, and reconfiguration of forms, the trapezoid, double jam, step motif, and masonry styles that would justify their claims to and unify the land. Inca architects took their inspiration from places from Tiwanaku, Awari, and Chiripa that connected their past and present. References to, Ti to Tiwanaku elevated their authority through its association with the gods and the myths of creation, to Lake Titicaca and possibly the ruin itself, which they might have conceived as a pacarina. The use of the trapezoid re reinforced Inca exercise of political command over the highlands. Not only did the trapezoid link them with Wari, the, the last great highland civilization prior to the rise of the Inca, but more importantly, it legitimated their role as conquerors and unifiers of the contemporary diverse politics of the highland region. Okay. It has been suggested that the trapezoid evokes the abstracted contours of a mountain. The high Andean peaks surrounding places like Cusco and Machu Picchu are the most compelling features rising, above the, rising from the landscape to altitudes of over 12,000 feet. Two such sacred mountains are Salkantai, which dominates the region around Machu Picchu, and Asangat, which stands to the east of Cusco. Mountains constitute an appropriate motif for a people whose heartland is located in the highlands and from whom mountains have played such a fundamental, practical, and spiritual role. Perhaps the most sacred mountain is Huanacari, worshipped as a huaca which represented one of the ancestral brothers who turned to stone during the journey to Cusco. Mountains were venerated for many reasons, but especially because they were believed to govern the weather and were the sources from which valley rivers flowed, assuring the fertility of crops and the health of animals. They were said to be the true owners of what was produced from the lands around them, and so became the locus of political cohesion among the ethnic groups living nearby. 
Johann Reinhardt suggests that mountains were therefore may therefore have been perceived as protectors and as war gods, um, an association the Inca may have fostered for the sake of expansionist interests and to legitimize their rule. Mountains are also liminal entities in the sense that they connect the earth and the sky. The role of the mountain as cosmic integrator complemented that of the Sapa Inca himself. The first Inca, Manco Capac, and his sister, or wife, joined the three levels of the cosmos, the sky, the human world, and the earth itself, by thrusting the golden staff of the sun into the mountain of Anakari. In a similar manner to the Golden Staff, mountain, mountains are embodied in the ground but pierce the heavens to reach into the, but pierce the horizon to reach into the heavens. It is therefore not surprising to find that the ink employed the powerful and symbolic trapezoidal shape which might have represented the idea of the integrating mountain in a number of architectural contexts. It is recalled in many usnus, uh, which are rectangular or stepped pyramidal stone constructions that were situated in the plazas of, of large cities, such as uh, Vikas Huaman and Wilka Huaman. Uh, while some temples, such as that of the Kari Kancha in Cusco, were only accessible to the Inca nobility, plazas were used for numerous kinds of rituals witnessed by all Inca and non-Inca people. Plazas were usually located in the middle of Inca settlements and usnus were constructed in the physical center of the plaza to represent the highest political and spiritual authority of the empire. From these platforms, key religious, political, and military ceremonies were performed. Johann Reinhardt speculates that Usnus metaphorically evoked the mountain gods and served as the loci for supplications to them. John Heislop describes the Usnus as stones over which liquids were poured into drains as offerings to the sun, whose image was placed on a seat nearby. Uh, Bernardo Cobo, who's a chronicler on the other hand, wrote that the Sapa Inca sat upon these platforms during rituals and spectacles of military prowess, an observation of, um, corroborated in a drawing that you see here by Guaman Poma of the Sapa Inca seated upon an usnu, surrounded by his military generals. Oftentimes, the clauses within which the usnus were situated, like that at Tambo, Colorado, and in Kawasi were also trapezoidal. Um, Rebecca Stone Miller has pointed out that in these examples, the converging sides of the plazas cause a space to be telescoped to even greater depth, optically exaggerating the already vast scale of the communal area. As an embodiment of the ideological center, the quadrilateral shape of the trapezoidal threshold, along with other architectural forms, was widely disseminated throughout the Inca Empire. The central order of Cusco was to be conveyed symbolically as well as politically throughout the conquered territories. Key features of Cusco's architecture, such as its Sun tem Temple, the Cari Cancha that we see here, were replicated in territorial, con uh, territorial constructions and ritual precincts were built with Cusco-style fine masonry at places like Olantan Tambo, Incahuasi, and many other sites. However, manifestations of the trapezoidal shape were more common than Inca masonry styles, making the trapezoid the defining signature of the empire. Trapezoidal portals and recesses were created from a full range of building materials, from uncut field stones, clay, and adobe to fine masonry. They appeared in all kinds of Inca buildings, whether residential, military, administrative, or sacred in function. They were incorporated in the, into the concha, a rectangular enclosure with three or four dwellings placed symmetrically around a central courtyard as exemplified by the Kari Kancha itself, as well as the Kalanka, a long rectangular hall generally located in a plaza that was used for big feasts in which conquered people were hosted um, and, and, and fed and feasted and cared for after their mita service had been performed. And here we have a huge 
um, Kalanka, and here's a plan of it, and you can see how the entire circumference of the interior walls are studded with these small uh, trapezoidal niches. Trapezoidal thresholds fulfilled a variety of purposes as components of the spatial and social hierarchy of all Inca state structures. In residences, quadrilateral niches contained eating vessels, clothes, or farming uh, implements, while at temples like the Coricancha, they held huacas and sacrifices. The tall niches or tabernacles facing the central court of the Coricancha, which was once plated in gold and silver and studded with precious stones, served as the thrones for the Sapa Inca during important rituals to the sun. In Pacarinas, such as the... Um, this, this wonderful um, cleft at Machu Picchu where you can see there are large um, scale niches in the inside, the mummified bodies of ancestors may have been entombed in the tall niches lining the walls. By deploying a common form, the Inca brought together the functional and the sacred, the ordinary and the prestigious, social, religious, economic, and political activities were united under the absolute rule of the state. This strategy was characteristic of the Inca, who used an array of simplification and integration mechanisms to manage its growing ethnically diverse population. Standardized forms of pottery and textiles were developed and distributed throughout the empire, for example. Quechua, the Quechua language, was declared mandatory for all subjects of the state. In addition, the central government devised numerous building standards from which ethnically different people lived in physically dissimilar regions were required to comply. Uniformity was evident in techniques applied to control over aspects of material production in the construction of roads, bridges, and buildings. The trapezoidal threshold was yet another means for linking diverse subjects through repeated visual forms. And I will try to wrap it up in the next five or seven minutes. Okay, conquering views. Evocative of the Inca, um, Inca homeland and placed at its significant sites controlling passage and movement, the trapezoidal shape may well have been seen to signify the presence of the conquering Inca. The Inca chronicler Guaman Poma made drawings of ro various royal Inca and soldiers. Here we have uh, the Sapa Inca Pachacuti dressed as a soldier. Uh, he was carrying a four-sided shield, which are narrow at the top and at the bottom. They are trapezoidal. Unfortunately, actual Inca shields have not survived through the centuries to corroborate his pictorial representations. Moreover, Guaman Poma failed in his drawings of Inca buildings uh, to represent doorways, windows, and niches as trapezoidal. He shows them as rectangular, a fact which brings into question the accuracy of his images as ethnographic documents. Nevertheless, there is the possibility that, in fact, the shield, the Inca shield, well, took a trapezoidal form too, which would speak to the idea that it represented not only the idea of the Inca state, but also was specifically tied to the idea of warfare and conquest. Um, so I'm going to have to paraphrase this extensively, but if we, if we take that idea that the trapezoidal shape is connected to ideas of conquest and apply it to Inca architecture, what we find is that a lot of Inca sites, there seems to be a purposeful layout in which people are led through, one is led through often very circuitous and complex architectural spaces to end up at a doorway or a window that overlooks a particular location in the environment. Um, there is uh, plenty of evidence for the use of thresholds as a way to guard spaces. And so what I want to argue is that the idea of vision of actually looking at a space and specifically looking at it through a trapezoidal threshold was a vehicle for thinking about Inca concepts of conquest. And key to Inca practices of conquest, and one of the reasons why they were so successful in expanding and creating this huge empire is that they did not try to con conquer entire regions. They were extremely selective. One of the things that they figured out was if you gain control and conquer a pacarina, or a huaca, a community's local huaca, which might be a stone in the middle of a field, and you remove that huaca and put it back to Cusco, 
you have captured a piece of a territory. But that pacarina or that cloaca is what binds the community together, and therefore you gain control over them. So um, a lot of Inca architecture seems to replicate that idea in the sense that it's about creating threshold spaces that are definitely aligned with specific places in the environment that are capturing and transforming natural landscape into something that's cultural, either for military purposes or for, for religious purposes. So, um, if I had time, I would, I would explore that, but, um, you know, trapezoidal shaped doorways and windows in Inca architectural sites would definitely serve the cause of Inca expansion by directing site and thereby enabling, on a conceptual level, at least conquest and domination. To underscore these connections, it's necessarily to delve into Inca creation beliefs and the connection between the act of seeing and controlling that which is seen. So the cosmos brought forth by the creator god, Viracocha, consisted of two basic components. He created the sky and the earth. The earth was conceived of as feminine, and it was associated with darkness, fluidity, and chaos. The first order of time was um, dominated by this feminine period of time, which was mostly earthly, dark, watery, and feminine. The sky, which represents the second order of time in which the Inca are born into, was masculine, and it was associated with light, cultivation, and social order. In Inca mythology, thresholds, doorways, and windows were often came to be the instrumentalities through which the sun shines onto the earth in acts of creation, in acts that, that, that shift um, time from the time of the earthly dark realm, feminine realm, to the realm of masculinity and the sun and light. One legend explains that the sun beaming through a window brought forth the birth of the founder of the Inca, namely Manco Capac. Similarly, the first Inca were believed to have left the cave of Pacari Tambo um, as the sun rose at dawn. At several sacred sites, gateways called intipunku or sun gates, served as conduits of the sun's rays in contexts of ritual associated with the Inca, with Inca origins and myth. Um, so during acts of creation, the sun was said to penetrate the earth and dominate it. Several myths recount that this liminal transformatory process occurred as the sun shone, shone through a window. And this process is ritualized every year during the winter solstice as the sun shines through a window onto a rock outcrop at the so-called observatory at Machu Picchu. Sun and earth are fused into a rectangular shape of light framed by a trapezoidal window that shines onto a carved niece on a geometricized border. So here we have a photograph, I think this is a National Geographic photograph, um, at Machu Picchu where we see during the winter solstice the sun comes over the top of the mountain and directly through this trapezoidal shaped window and casts a perfect trapezoidal shape of beam of sun onto a recessed trapezoidal piece of earth on the stone above. The structuring role of thresholds was also realized in caves. A cave was the mouth of the earth, the domain of darkness, mutability, sound, formlessness, and birth. At several caves, the interiors were elaborately decorated with trapezoidal niches. Still visible in the cleft room at Machu Picchu, I don't have that, sorry. And the Temple of the Moon. The entrances and passages of caves, such as ones that we see here, were subtly marked with smooth surfaces or rigidly geometricized, so that order and control was imposed on the organic aspects of the cave. Artificial entrances were sometimes fashioned at caves so that it would be structured and marked places of transition into the regulated social world of light. The Inca, the sons of Inti, appropriated sites as instruments of domination. 
According to Inca legend, it was upon seeing the sacred site of Cuzco for the first time that one of the ancestral brothers shaped mountains and valleys of the lands and laid claim to them. So the act of seeing something is fundamental to the act of creation itself. Once Cusco had been established, Pachacuti then vanquished the Chancas, who were an ethnic group residing on the outskirts of Cusco Valley. And he, was, he is said to have been able to conquer the Chancas because he had, I quote, the power to see everything he chooses. These myths also reveal how thresholds facilitated capture and supremacy by determining or obscuring what could be seen. Pachacuti's descendant, Inca Capac Yupanqui, defeated, he's said to have defeated, a foreign huaca by throwing open the doors and the windows of the dark dwelling in which it was housed. Once revealed and exposed to the sunlight, the huaca was, was overpowered. Sight was therefore clearly tied to Inca ideas about conquest. And, um, you know, like I said earlier, the Inca, you know, once they conquered new territories, would very subtly mark the landscape with works such as these, would create pacarinas, would include, you know, would transform caves with the Tiwanaku inspired. Uh, threshold iconography um, as a way of kind of capturing those territories. So, um, sorry, folks, I have a whole bunch of stuff here I have to get through. So the Inca were very much, you know, a lot of sites, especially Machu Picchu, we have a lot of examples where thresholds seem to be purposefully aligned with specific points in the landscape as a way to transform them into um, cultural entities that were of significance to the Inca. Uh, the Inca also liked to place a lot of framing walls around natural objects, field stones that were huacas. They would simply build a frame and sort of a very subtle frame around it that marked it off as being a sacred site and being specifically an Inca site. So, in so doing, natural elements were often inscribed with Inca visual conventions and displayed in a way that Nicholas Green calls a vocabulary capable of bringing nature into being as social activity. Culturally marking rock outcrops provided an effective technique for laying claim to the territory of subject peoples and incorporating the huacas and pacarinas of local communities within the domain of the Inca. So thresholds mark places where vistas and therefore metaphorically speaking access to territory could be gained or lost. Bernardo Cobo wrote of the importance attributed to the Inca to prospects at Huacas along the Seque lines radiating out from the Caricancha in Cusco. In the four administrative sectors known as the Suyus, Cobo records nine Huacas that were considered sacred because they were, they were set at places where, quote, what is on this side is lost to sight and the other side is revealed. From these thresholds, one could behold Cusco, itself an important Huaca, the center of the empire and cosmos, the repository of Inca past and present. Conversely, these were dangerous places because as one walked past the Huaca, one could no longer see Cusco. Moreover, these Huacas were, were located along the boundaries between the conquered territory of the Cusco Valley and the land owned by the Inca by privilege. Cobo's account of these Huacas indicates that they were clearly consider, considered threshold sites. He describes them variously as a flat place between two hills, a river, a river line like a gateway, or a gateway between two hills. So not only was it, did the, were the Inca very interested in the idea of using thresholds to frame particular places in the environment that were powerful to them, but they also were invested in marking places where you gained the sight of something or you could conversely lost sight of it. So we have that interesting reversal and, or inversion going on. Bernardo Cobo's description of Seque lines suggests still another relationship between thresholds and conquest. 
The chronicler mentions that along these lines, a number of huacas were comprised of stones that were placed in windows or doorways. Each huaca was associated with a victorious military encounter. For example, one huaca erected near the Coricancha marked um, the site where a man had helped Inca Yupanqui with a battle, and he sat down in a window and turned to stone, which again really reinforces the idea of the window as a place of transformation. Um, this could be one reason why statues were placed in niches. They are points of transformation, but also containment. Several huacas in windows or doorways were said to be pururacas, which were stones temporarily transformed into soldiers to help Pachacuti overcome the chancos. There is a myth in which field stones actually were transformed from stones to humans to warriors to create a vast um, army that assisted Pachacuti um, beat the bat you know, win the battle over the chancas, and then afterwards they transformed back into stones and were then lodged within um, niches. Um, after the enemy had been overrun, the soldiers turned back into stone. Thus, thresholds mark points where various mythical beings associated with warfare turned from or into stone. Kobo uh, did not offer details about the Quakas, however... Oh dear. Okay. Um, except for a stone said to constitute the lithification of Hornikari, which was carried into each battle. He described the stone as of moderate size, without representational shape and somewhat tapering. Koba's observation is confirmed in a drawing by Guaman Poma that we see here that shows a Sapa Inca sacrificing to a group of portable huacas before the mountain of Hanakari. Some of these Incas are depicted as being figurative, while others are non-figurative, geometric, and attenuated to the top, like a trapezoidal shape. Lodging huacas associated with war and victory within thresholds may have been intended to secure future victories over enemies and signify the acquisition of new land and resources. Bernardo Cobo states that, quote, the fear inspired by the Pururacas was more effective than the fighting of the Incas troops in all of their successful in encounters because often the enemy would, would flee almost without putting up a fight once encountering these sacred stones that were considered to be able to transform into soldiers. Pururaka, meaning, quote, hidden uh, traitors, were contained or held captive within niches and doors, keeping them in the service of the state. In the Inca myth of origin, when one of the ancestral brothers threatens his sibling's decision to conquer the land around Cusco, he sent back to the cave in Pacaritambo and imprisoned there. In so doing, chaos and dissemination, uh, dis dissension is contained. Seizure of enemy huacas was a long-standing Andean practice adopted by the Inca. Ancestral huacas governed and sanctioned the land um, tenancy of, the, of their kin groups. Hence, possession of a huaca permitted the Inca to rule that kin and lay claim to their land. In fact, the territories of the whole empire were symbolically held captive in Cusco. The principle of securing parts to lay claim to the whole was carried out by Manco Capac when he divided Cusco into four regions, representing the four provinces of Tuans and Siu. He then ordered that representatives from all territories of the empire live in the quadrant, quadrant of the city corresponding in direction to the provinces which, with which they came. In a similar manner, all possessions, including clothing, eating utensils, farming equipment, and food, were kept within trapezoidal niches, giving notice that it was the state that ultimately owned them. So for the Inca, light and sight provided not only the means by which to conquer, but also to organize the cosmos, and by extension, assure the proper governance of human realm. Once the sun, Inti, had been called forth, Things of the world be, could be created, give shape, and placed within their correct order. By capturing and harnessing celestial bodies, the Inca could control time and space. This is illustrated, and this is my conclusion, at the Inti Huantana, or the hitching post of the sun, stone which is located at the summit of Machu Picchu. And these kinds of stones are found at other uh, locations within Tuantan Siu. The site is approached via steps that divide at the entrance. One set of steps leads onto the stone, which you see over here, and repeated over here. 
Um, so one set of steps leads um, onto the stone, which is generally trapezoidal in shape, um, as is the intrusion at the top. The other set of stairs faces a trapezoidal window, which you see on the right, through which one can gaze at a portion of the mountain peak beyond. At the foot of the stairs is a V-shaped depression, which uh, Johann Reinhardt interprets as being an intentional marker for placing an onlooker in position to see the hitching post of the sun in alignment with the mountain beyond it. Furthermore, from this angle, a viewer may perceive the dual trapezoidal outlines of the solid intihuatana or hitching post of the sunstone and the void created by the window frame to the right. A set of reciprocal reversals between the mass of the stone and the ephemeral threshold is evident, confirming the concept of huaca as a double, material and immaterial, solid and void. The Intihuatana stone is carved so that it will catch the movement of light and shadow across its surface. It is said to be the hitching post of the sun. It is thought to mark the path of the sun during the solstice, thereby reversing and pulling the sun back to ensure the renewal of the seasons and the new agricultural season. The Intihuatana stone fixes and regulates the light of the sun at a particular time while the edge of the window locks in a view, a place in space, in this case, a mountain. So through sight, power is redirected from the sky to the earth. Through the articulation of the second dimension, in the dance of light and shadow on the Intihuatana stone, and the, the, the threshold frame, authority is exerted over the totality of dimensions. The hitching post controls the fourth dimension, time, because it marks the solstice, while the threshold um, controls the third dimension, space, by pulling the far mountain near. In the merger of place, space, and time, one can visualize the intersection of what Jonathan, Jonathan Smith refers to as emplacement, the act through which humankind, nature, and cosmos are united. And I'm going to end there. <laughs>